browser, any browser. Here I'm using Chrome. Then in the in the search button, you just a search area. You just type Python free download. Then you'll be getting a page like this. So there you can see download Python. Click on that. When you when you click on download Python, you'll be getting a, a page. You'll be directed to a page where you, you'll be seeing different versions of Python. You can download any one of them. The latest version is here 3.12. You can download any of them. Here I've used, I'm using 2.7. You can freely download it. And then uh, it, it, uh, it'll, it'll show you a wizard. On completing that wizard, it gets the Python interpreter. It gets installed in your system. Then you can open. When you open it, you get a user interface like this. And here you can do all the programs. Okay, so this is the way how you install Python. Now Python, very basically, it can be used as a calculator. I'll show you how it is used as a calculator. You can run small arithmetic operations. Also, you can run small lines of codes. I hope this screen is visible to you. So it can make a small addition. Just, just type 2 plus 3. It will give you the sum. Or you can uh, make a difference. You can do a subtraction. You can make a multi. You can do a multiplication. It gives you the answer. Just so you can, or you can even do a small tedious uh, arithmetic calculation. You can give it. It gives you the answer. So Python it can be used simply as a calculator. You don't have to declare the variables like x equal to two, y equal to three, and then multiply x star y. You don't have to give like that. You can, if it is a simple arithmetic operation, you can simply use Python as a calculator. Okay. Also, you can write, you can run small lines of codes also you in Python interpreter. So Python, it, simply it can be used as a calculator. It performs small arithmetic operations. Also, you can, it is convenient for running small lines of codes. Then there are two ways in which we can do programming in Python. That is either by interactive mode or by file mode. The one that I showed you just now that we can write, we can simply uh, make small programs, write down small programs in this interface. That's called the interactive mode. Or what you can do is that you can take a notepad. You take any text editor. For example, in Windows, you can take notepad. Take a notepad and then write your code. Write your program there. You save it in dot py extension that's very important when you save the file save the file name with dot py extension and then you have to run the file call the uh, call the file and then you can run it so you can that's called the file mode so these are the various ways you can interact with python by two types two ways you can do python programming that is one is by interactive mode where you can write the line of code and then you get the uh, output then and there because it is an interpreter or you can go to a file mode that is you can take an any text editor write down the program there save it with dot py extension and then run that code okay so these are the different ways two ways in which you can interact with python then comes an important thing is variables we use variables in python so variable is nothing but its value changes variable holds a value we give a value to a variable which changes it is a variable holds a value which is not constant it changes so the process of writing a variable name i'll show you is called the declaring the variable for example i'll write x equal to five now when i call for x i'm calling x i get the answer five i get the output as five because the five five is a number or five is an integer which i have assigned to the variable x the equal sign is not the equal sign that we use in mathematics. It is called the assignment operator. So I've assigned a value 5 and I've assigned an integer 5 to the variable x. This is called assigning the variable or this is called a declaration process. I'm declaring or I'm telling the Python interpreter that now at the present moment, the, va the value of the variable x is 5. Now if I write x equal to 10 and then I call x. Now it will be showing 10. So the latest value that we that you give to the variable will be the value it contains. Okay, the variable doesn't hold a constant value. It always it always shows you the latest value. So variable always holds a value which changes, and the process of 
applying uh, giving a value to a variable that is called declaring the variable so when i wrote x equal to 10 or x equal to 5 that process of declaring a variable telling the python interpreter that this is the current value of this variable that's called declaring the variable there's another thing called uh, initializing the variable initializing the variable means to give an initial value to a variable there may be situations in which you have to write you have, you have to run a program where you'll be using a variable the the variable the value of the variable may be changing when you run the program so it might so it has to start from some starting point so you have to specify or you have to give the python interpreter the indication that you should start from this value i'll show you an example for example i'm using the variable that i'm using is count count equal to zero i'm telling the python interpreter that the initial value the starting point of the variable count should be zero okay this is called initializing the variable now i'm using a for loop i know i have not discussed the for loop but just for showing you how the initialization works i'll be uh, showing you the for loop so i can write for x in a range i'll show i'll i'll be telling you what all these are what is a for loop what is a range and all later in my class but just for the sake of Introducing what is the initialization, I'll be showing this. For x in range 0 to 5, count equal to count plus 1. Okay, so now here I'm writing initial value of count should be taken as 0. Now I'm using a for loop. It is a loop. You might be familiar with loops. So it is, in this loop, I'm giving the variable count, but its, its value changes with every loop. In one loop, in the first for loop, the count, the value of count will be one. In these next for loop, the count, the value of count changes. So this, the value of count changes, but it should start from somewhere. So Python interpreter doesn't know where to start from. So that starting point I've already given that count is equal to zero. So that's called, this process is called initializing the variable. Okay, so now count, now I need to print count, print x. When I print, see, you can see, initially, the output, you can see, initially, the value of count was zero. That was what I gave. Then when it went in the loop, the, the, uh, the count, the value of count should incre increase by one. That's what I've given as the line of code. So now the zero plus one in the first uh, the first four loop, the value of count becomes one. In the next four loop, the value of count becomes two, three, four, and so on. Okay. So the process of declaring a variable and initializing a variable is different when you give a value to a variable say this is the value of the variable and this will be the value that i'll be using throughout the program that process is called declaring the variable now if you have a loop where the value of the variable changes with every loop then you have to give an initial value to the proper initial value to the variable so that initializing is called initializing the variable for example, I've given her count equal to zero. That's from where the Python interpreter should start the loop. So the count equal to zero is called the initializing the variable. And I all, I've already mentioned that equal sign is not the equal sign that we use in maths. It is not an equality operator, but it is an, and it is an assignment operator. A single equal sign is an assignment operator. Okay. So I'm an assignment operator. It assigns a value to a variable. Okay, so these are this is all about variables. Again, uh, there's some more to show about variables. For example, if I'm writing year is equal to 2016, I'm writing year equal to 2016. Now the value of year will be when I call year, it will give me the output 2016. Again, I'm writing year equal to 2023. Now, when I call year, it won't be 2016, but the value which I entered in the present, the, the, the latest value will be shown. The latest value which I give to which I assign to the variable will be the value of the variable here. So latest I gave 2023 as the value. So the value of the variable will be 2023. Also, you can assign different values uh, you can assign the same value to different variables for example i'm writing name one equal to albert okay i'm giving a name one equal to albert now i'm assigning name two 
to name one. I've assigned a string. This is a string. I'm assigning a string Albert to to a variable called name one. Now, next I'm assigning name one to another variable. One way I'm assigning one variable to another variable. Name one variable to another variable name two. Now, when I call name two, the value which was stored in name one, since it was assigned to name two, will be stored in the, the value will be stored in name two also. Okay, so, so in this way you can assign one, you can assign a value, you can assign values to multiple variables. Next, we come to the scan, standard data types in Python. This is a very important portion in, uh, in while you study the fundamentals. So basically, there are six data types. Some textbooks, they show even seven data types, including sets. But here, I'm not, I'm not discussing sets. There are six uh, standard data types in Python. Data types means you can communicate with the Python interpreter only in any of these data types, in any, on, in any of these forms cannot communicate with data with Python interpreter in any other language, in any other data forms. So whenever you give any data to Python or you get some data from Python, you can only communicate in any of these forms. That is, it should be either a numeric data type or a string or a list, tuple or dictionary or Boolean data type. These are the only types of data that you can deal with in Python. So the first one is numeric data type. Under numeric data type, we have several uh, types that is integers, floating point numbers. Floating point num integers means whole numbers without decimal points. Floating point numbers means the decimal numbers. Then complex numbers, as you know, it is a combination of a real and imaginary part. So you can see, I'll show you. Say I'm writing num1. Num1 equal to 2. When I call num1, I get two. Okay, I get two. Now, if you, you can also ask Python interpreter, what kind of data type? What data type is this two? The data which I've written now. For that, I can use the function called type. Just write type in bracket. Whatever you give inside the bracket of a function, it is called the argument. So, as an argument, I'm giving giving num one. Okay. So you get see you can see. You are getting the type as int. Int stands for integer. Okay. Again, I can write x is equal to 5.9. This is a decimal number. This also comes under numeric data type. I can call x. You get 5.9. It is a floating point number. Again, we can check what is this data type. What is the data type of 5.9 of x? Okay. Then you get float. So floating point number. Again, you can, also, you can also write complex numbers. If, if you want to write a co in complex notation, you can write like this. X is equal to, you have to use a function called complex. And in bracket or as an argument, you have to give the real part and followed by the imaginary part, you have to separate it by a comma. And the out, when you print this print x, you get it in a complex form. That is 2 will be the real part. 2 plus, you get it as 2 plus 3j. 2 is the real part, 3 is the imaginary part. So this is the numeric data type. It deals with, under numeric data type, you have uh, freedom to use integers, floating point numbers, decimal numbers, as well as complex numbers. Then comes the strings. Strings means anything, any object which is enclosed within inverted commas is considered as a string in Python. So you can use single inverted comma, you can use double inverted or even tri triple quoted strings. You can even use triple quotes. So anything within inverted within inverted commas is considered as a string in Python. And what what kinds of uh, uh, data you can use? That is within string with strings you can use alphanumeric. That is you can use numbers, you can use alphabets, or combination of them, or even special characters can be used as strings. The only thing is that you have to enclose them within inverted commas. So that becomes a string. I'll show you. I can write a string x is equal to I'm writing within inverted commas. When when Python interpreter sees an inverted comma, it understands it is a string. So I'm writing hello space Python. I'm closing the inverted commas. So now just ask for the type. We can write the type type of x. When I ask the type, you see the output is 
type str str stands for string so in this way you can find it uh, you can find the type so a string is anything is a, it, it it's not only about alphabets you can include numbers also still still then it will be a string for example is this right within inverted commas i'm writing one two three it's just numbers okay now you search for the type of x it won't give you a num it won't give you an integer but it will show you as a string the type will be displayed as a string because you have in, enclosed it within inverted commas you can use special characters also x is equal to at hash dollar then you get some numbers also okay i'm enclosing this these within inverted commas now check the type type of x you get it is a string so string is anything any object you when you enclose enclose it within inverted commas it can be single double or triple then it becomes a string so when python interpreter shows a, a, a sees a pair of inverted commas then and then python interpreter understands it is a string now so there are now, not only the numbers numbers can do operations i didn't show you the operations with numbers because in the beginning i showed you that python can be used as a calculator there we used integers right uh, one thing is that you can also do division division you can do any arithmetic operations I forgot to tell you one thing. You see, under numeric data type, suppose we divide two integers. I'm dividing two integers, five by two. The answer that I'm getting, the output that I'm getting is two. But we know when five, when you divide five by two, you should get two point five. But the thing is that Python interpreter understands five is an integer, two is also an integer. When you divide two integers, you should be getting an integer. So that's the logic of Python interpreter. So what should you do? What you should do is that when you do a division, you convert either one of them, either the numerator or the denominator or both, to floating point numbers. That is 5.0 by 2. I'm writing 5.0 by 2. Then I get the correct answer. So it is always better to use numbers in floating point notation in order to avoid these kind of errors. So similar to this numeric data type, the operations that you can do with numeric data type. Several operations can also be performed with string data type. You might be wondering what kind of operations can be done with strings. So we can see some of them. Say I'm writing, I'm writing a string hello. Okay, this is one string. And I'm writing a plus sign. And I'm writing another string, Python. Python is another string. So I've, I've written two strings here, hello and Python. And in between, I've put a plus sign. This plus sign is not an addition, but it is called a concatenation operator. It is uh, this concatenation operator. It is used for combining two strings. So when you get the out, what will be the output? You see, you get a single string. So it com the concatenation operator combines two separate strings to form a single string. Okay. So you get hello Python. You might be thinking, where is a space? There won't be a space because we haven't given it. So we can also give a space. What do you have to do? You can write hello. Hello is one string. Plus, I'm using the concatenation operator. We can give a space as a string. Space uh, as if space is also a string. If you in, if you enclose it within inverted commas, it is also a string. So I'm giving the space as a string plus this is again a concatenation operator plus Python. Now you see the output. You get hello space Python as one string. Okay. In this way, so it can call you can combine different strings to a to a single string. Here we have seen that even a space under inverted commas is a string. So this is the concatenation operator. There are two more operators. You can repeat the same string several number of times using the repetition operator. You can see this is hello is one string. You can repeat using the repetition operator is shown by asterisk. And I want to repeat it by three times. When I write hello star three, see you can see hello, hello, hello. It is repeated three times. And though all, all of them, they are they combine, they form one string, one single string. So you can repeat the same string several number of times using the repetition operator. There's one more operator called a slicing operator, which is very useful. Now, before going to the slicing operator, you should understand one thing that one property of strings that strings are an ordered sequence and it follows an index sequence. So if you have a, a string called Python, you see P will be in index position 0, Y will be in index position 1, T will be in index position 2, and so on. 
So there will be an indexing in strings. Indexing is followed in strings. That is, in each index position, there will, there will be an element. In that way, it is an ordered sequence. So if you, you can access the elements within a string using the index position. And this property is being used in slicing. So we can use a slicing operator. Say, I'm, I want to give any string, str equal to, I'm writing any string, hello. Or I can write Python also. So I'm writing here, hello. String, this is a string, hello. Now I want to access some part of the string. For that, I, I write the name of the variable which I've, to which I've assigned the, uh, the string, str. Within square brackets, I can specify the index position. I want to see what is there, which letter is there in index position 3. Okay, so I write within square brackets 3. That is the index position. When I write, I get 1. Uh, uh, sorry, I get L. So L is there in index position 3. Okay, there's not only a single value can be accessed, you can access a range of values also. For that, Named, you put the string variable, variable followed by square bracket. The square bracket is all you always remember it is for if you have a variable followed by square brackets, it is a slicing operator. So within the square brackets, I can give a range of values. Say I want to see the elements starting from zeroth index position to the fifth. If I give zero colon five, it will only show me elements starting from zero to four. So it will always show n minus one. It will always show elements one less. Okay, so zero colon five means it will show you show the elements starting from zero up to the fourth index. So you close it when you get see we get hello. So H is in you get the whole name because H is in zeroth index position. E is in one, L is in two, another L is in three, and four is O. Okay, so you get the whole thing. You can say S T R. I'm writing from, I need to see elements from the first index position up to the third index position. So that for that, I give four. So again, E double L. So in this way, you can access various parts of a string using the slicing operator. So we have now seen the different yes. operations. Uh, Ma'am, could you please uh, increase the phone size? In the format, you can increase the phone size now. Let me see. Uh, I think it's not possible. Okay, you can be uh, uh, I'll Okay, so these are the different operations which can be performed on strings. That is, you can add, you can combine two different strings to form a single string. That is the concatenation operator. You can repeat a single string several number of times. That is a repetition operator. And also you can slice. You can take a small part of a string. You can access various parts of a string and also take a range of values from a string using the slicing operator. Then uh, this is all about strings. Again, uh, there are some formatting functions also associated with strings, not only the operations. There's one more thing I'll show you. We can perform several operations on strings. There are several, for example, in Microsoft Word, you must have used the bold function, underline function. You have used the right align, left align, center align, justified. All these you use with the text in Microsoft Word. Similarly, we can do all those with strings in Python using some built-in functions. Built-in functions means they are ready to use functions. There are, those functions are actually several lines of code, but 
they are available in Python library. And so you can simply call it by its name. Each and every function, it has a name. I simply call it by its name and the function does its job. So we'll do some, we'll see some of the uh, string formatting functions. I'm writing a string, string uh, str equal to hello. This is one string. Now we can write string. I'm writing string dot center. I want to center align with string, but you might be thinking where, where will it be center aligned? So within the, uh, you have to give a pixel size. The pixel size, it should give a pixel size. And within that pixel size, it will be center aligned. For example, so as an argument to the center function, this dot center is the function. Excuse me. So we are we were talking about different functions. So there are different functions which we can apply to strings. String, I'm giving a string str equal to hello. This is a string. Now I'm writing string dot center. Dot center is the dot center brackets, a pair of brackets. This is the uh, this is a string formatting function. Dot center is a string formatting function. But you might be thinking, where will Maya, you... ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, I'm sorry for the interruption. Ma'am, your video is not visible. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So the, uh, I've given a string, string is equal to hello. Now I want to center align this string. But you might be thinking, where will we center align? So we have to actually give the pixel size. So give a pic pixel size. I'm giving a pixel size, say 20 or 30, give any pixel size. Within that pixel size, the string hello will be center aligned. So just. Sorry, I gave the name wrong. I gave the uh, I name I gave the name of the variable in a different way. That's why there's an error. Okay. See, you can see this output that within this you can see the two inverted commas, a pair of inverted commas. That's the 20 pixel width. Within that pixel width, the the string hello is center aligned. Okay. You can also left align. There's no need of left aligning because whenever you get an output is already left aligned. So you can see the right align, R just. For that, we use str dot R just. R just is a, is a string formatting function. Similar to the previous case, give the pixel size. So you can see within that, that inverted commas shows you the 20 pixel width. And within that 20 pixel width, you get the uh, string hello right aligned. So these are some of the string formatting functions. Oh, okay. Also, also you can give, you can write string is equal to I'm giving hello all in small letters. You can make it in title case for that str dot title. You can give like this str dot title. See, you get H is capitalized. Okay. Or you can give str is equal to, you can, I'm giving Python as fun in all all in the small letters, you can convert it to title case like this, str dot title. You can see the 
you can see the pi, uh, the first first letter the first letter of each and every word is capitalized so it is in title case so in this way you can uh, you can use different string formatting functions these are some of the string formatting functions so strings have operator operations like concatenation repetition slicing operations also you can, there are different string formatting functions for formatting strings then there is one more uh, thing that for example if i'm writing for example if i'm writing print print i am 6 feet Ma'am, am I am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay, okay. So if I'm, I'm writing print, I am six feet four inches tall. Okay. Now there is a problem with this print statement. Just right, just see, we said inverted commas means string. So when there is an inverted comma, Python interpreter understands it is a string. But here I've written six inches, I've written a single inverted comma, four. After four, I've written a double inverted comma, but this is this means something else. This is not for specifying a string. So what happens if I write like this? I may be I, there may be situations where you have to use the inverted commas other than referring to strings. So when you write like this, let's see what happens. It sh it's a Python interpreter tells you that it is an invalid syntax because Python interpreter thinks that the string will be ending with here. After four, the string will be ending here. So you need to, you want Python interpreter to ignore this inverted comma, uh, the first inverted comma. So you can use an escape character. You can use it like this, print I am six feet four inches. The single inverted comma is unaffected because we are, for referring strings, we have used double inverted comma. So use the backslash, the backslash, backslash is for ignoring the double inverted commas okay the backslash is an escape character it ignores it ignores the inverted comma so it is it tells the python interpreter to simply ignore this inverted comma then tall and now i close the string see now the six feet four inches will be printed the, the inverted commas will be printed so in order to uh, avoid a avoid some character you can use the backslash error. Backslash is an escape character. This is also one feature with that uh, one formatting function that you can use with strings. So this is all about strings. Now we can continue with other data types. List. List means any other. List is, uh, is nothing but a set of elements which are enclosed within square brackets and the elements will be separated by commas. So that's called the list. Similar to, I said, uh, anything within inverted commas is considered as a string. Similar way, when you write uh, anything within square brackets, within square brackets and the elements are separated by commas, Python interpreter understands it is a string. Uh, sorry, it, it is a list. For example, I'm writing a list here. I'm assigning uh, to it to a variable. X is equal to square bracket 2, 3, 4. Okay, this is a set of numbers 2, 3, 4. This is a list. Okay, I've enclosed it within, enclosed it within square brackets and the elements are separated by commas. Just check, check the type of X, type of X. When you check the type of X, pipe interpreter will tell you it is a list. Yes, not only numbers can be included, you can uh, include alphabets also. For example, you can use strings, strings within list. For example, one, two, three, these are numbers of numeric data type. You can add another, say, hello, Python. You can use hello, Python as a string. A string inside a string as an element within a list still then it is a, it is a list just check the type type of x you get it is a list okay 
or you can uh, you can include numbers strings as well as another list also as an element within a list those are called nested lists let's see how x is equal to 1 2 3 these are numbers i can include uh, i'm including at string hello python this is a string apart from that i'm i'm including another list 1 comma 2 1 comma 2 this is another list okay this this list 1 comma 2 is an element in the x list see you can see a list you have numbers you have strings as well as another list so even another list can be taken as an element can be an element within the with uh, can be an element within a list so this is how you can this is also a list if you check the type type of x check it check its type we get it is a list it is still a list so even list can be elements of another list okay so uh, so these are lists then similar to uh, strings we can combine we can combine two lists we can repeat the same list you can use a slicing operator everything just i'll show you how uh, show, show you how two one this is one list i'm using the concatenation operator plus is the concatenation operator i'm adding another list see you get a single list adding the elements of both the list so this is how the concatenation operator works you can repeat the same list three comma four it is repeat it thrice okay see three four is what is are the elements of the list the three four is repeated thrice so you can use a repetition operator or you can slice you can use a slicing operator also similar to strings the list also have indexing the first element if you are taking this x list this list x is equal to one two three hello python you see the indexing is like this one is in zeroth index two is in first index three is in second index hello python is in third index one comma two the list one comma two is in fourth index this is how the indexing goes so in the, there is even list are list are ordered sequences with indexing so because of this indexing i can use a, a slicing operator for example i'm using x slicing operator i've used the i've named this list as x so i'm using the slicing operator with x x the slicing operator i want to see elements from 2 to 4 when i write 2 colon 4 i'll be seeing only the elements starting from 2 up to 3 so you just see 3 and hello python see the elements which are there in index position 2 and 3 will be printed so this in this way you can uh, access the values in a access elements of a list using the slicing operator you can also create a copy of a list we can see how do you make a copy of a list for example i'm creating a list, list one this is list one is equal to two comma three comma four this is one list another list list two is equal to i'm writing i'm writing three strings okay So we have created two lists, list one consisting of numbers only and list two consisting of strings only. <clears throat> now I want to create a copy of a list. I want to create a copy of list two. For that, we have to use the copy function. For, for, for that also, we have a built-in function called copy function. But the, uh, but the problem is all uh, many of the functions will be belonging to a module. It, be, it may be belonging to a package. That package is called a module. So that module will be containing certain functions. So for using those functions, what you have to do is that you have to import the module first and then use the function. If you simply use the function, you get an error set, you get an error message. So if a function is belonging to a particular module, you have to import the module first. Okay. So what we're going to do is we have to use the copy function. I need to uh, create a copy of list two. So for that, I use the copy function, but copy is, 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 is there in a, in, a, in a different module. So I have to import the module first. For that, I have to write a one line of code, the import statement. So from, I'll be writing like this, from copy, import copy. Okay, so you're importing, importing the copy function from the copy module. Now you can write 
x list 3 i am writing list 3 equal to copy this is the copy function in bracket you write the name of the list which you have to copy whose copy you want so i need the copy of list 2 so i'm writing list 2 as an argument argument now when you call list 3 call list 3 you get the list 2 right because we have copied list 2 to list 3 now what i'm going to do is that i'm going to add an element to list 3 simply add an element to list 3 for, for that we can use a different function we have a, a, a built-in function for that list 3 dot append dot append is the function is, is the uh, built-in function for adding elements to a list and the added elements will be will be added to the end of the list not anywhere else it will be added to the end of the list so list 3 dot append as an argument i'm giving another, another element so i've added added list uh, added to the list another element biology now you just call list 3 you see you can see the existing elements plus the newly added element at the end of the list okay now this this i have done i've copied list 2 to list 3 okay and i've changed list 3 now let's see whether list 2 has changed because list 2 is the original list and list 3 is the copy list will a change in copy change the original let's see let's see list 2 if you print list 2 you see the same the previous elements are still there there, there are no new elements which means if you create a copy list whatever changes you make in the copy list won't be affected in the original list and vice versa okay so this is the benefit of using a copy function but the thing to be noted is that it is belonging to a copy module so you have to first import it and then use the copy function even a you can uh, even an empty list is a list if you write a equal to simply a pair of square brackets that is also an, that is also a list it is called an empty list see it just check the type of a check the type of a you get it is a list so even an empty even an empty list is a list i said about the append dot append function the, the dot append built in function for adding elements to a list i said the added element the element which has to be added always goes to the end of a list if you want the element to be inserted somewhere in between i want uh, I want an element biology to be inserted between English and maths. So I want to in insert it an index position one. Okay. English is in, 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 in index position zero. Maths is in Eng index position one. And physics is in index position two. I want to insert it between English and maths. So what do I have to do? I have to use the built-in function dot insert. In dot insert is the built-in function for that. So list two. I have to insert this in list two. So list two dot insert give the element which should be inserted, and also the position, the index position as the argument. I'm giving the index position as one. There is some error. Let me check once. I'm inserting the element two in index position one. Now, when I, when I, uh, okay, when I print the list, you can see the one, the element one has been inserted in index position two. Okay, so you can, you can write list two dot insert. I want to insert in index position one. And a string biology. Now I print list two. See biology will be inserted in index position one okay this is how you insert a particular element in any index position if you use dot append function it will be inserted at the end of the list but if you use the dot insert function it will be inserted in any index position of your choice okay also you can remove elements from a list how do you remove if i want to remove elements uh, list 
dot list two. I want to remove elements from list two. List two dot remove. When I give remove, I should specify within as an argument what should be removed. I I want to remove biology. So you should write biology as an argument. Now print list two. You see biology has been removed. So you can use the dot remove function. Also you can use the dot pop function where the pop function it it asks you the index position of the element which should be removed, not the element which should be removed. So write list two dot pop in bracket when I write two index position two. You get one is there in index position two. When I print list two, you can see the the element in index position two has been removed. So there's a difference between dot remove and dot pop. In dot pop operation, uh, dot pop built-in function, you have to give the index position of the element which should be removed. In dot remove, you have to give the element which should be removed. So these are some of the uh, built-in functions with uh, which we can use for lists. Next, uh, standard data type in Python is tuples. Tuples are also similar to list, but it can it cannot be changed. That is. When you create a tuple, you can access the elements which are there in the tuple, but you cannot, you can add elements, but you cannot change the existing elements in the tuple. So it is also called as a read only list. So tuples are, if lists are uh, in, enclosed within square brackets, tuples are enclosed within simple brackets. I'll show you a tuple. I'm writing tuple one is equal to, I'm enclosing a few numbers. You can use several data types inside, uh, inside tuples. You can use Numbers, strings, or another list also um, can be uh, given as elements inside a tuple. So I'm giving some few numbers and a string. Okay. So this is tuple. I've created a tuple one with a few numbers and a string. Now just to just check the type of type of tuple one. When you check the type of tuple one, you get the type is tuple. So Python interpreter understands it is a tuple. Once it, she, once it sees the uh, elements which are separated by commas. It doesn't matter if you if you use the simple brackets. Even if you don't use the simple brackets, if it sees, Python interpreter sees different elements separated by commas, Python interpreter understands it is a tuple. Also, there is uh, similar to the list and strings, there are several operations which can be performed uh, on tuples. That is, you can combine two tuples, you can repeat the same tuple, you can access values in a tuple. Tuple is also an ordered sequence, just like strings and lists. So you can well, simply by giving its index position, you can access various elements of a tuple, or you can access a range of elements using the slicing operator. All these operations can be performed on tuples. Then uh, a, a major feature, uh, an attractive feature with tuples is that a tuple assignment. I'll show you the example, tuple assignment. I'm creating a tuple. Anil equal to, I'm creating a tuple, the tuple is assigned to a variable Anil. I'm writing an ID, the first name, the last name, This is one tuple. I've written a number, a first name, last name, the place, and a year. This is one tuple. And now I must, uh, there's another, I'm creating another tuple like this. creating another tuple id first name last name place year of birth and i'm assigning it to the same tuple same tuple name that is anil okay now when i call id i get 221 when i call first name i get anil when i call last name i get rahul when i call place i get delhi when i uh, when i call birth year of birth I get 1971. So this is an attractive feature 
of tuples that that is you can store elements like this and then you can call them you can call them as you want to. okay so these so tuples are actually used for storing data so this is the this is called tuple assignment you assign a tuple to one name okay tuple you assign to, to a variable to the same variable you assign another another tuple which will be related and then you can access the elements of the tuple in this way so this is called tuple assignment another application of tuple assignment is swapping of variables for example you can x is equal to 2 x is equal to 2 y equal to 3 these are the values i have assigned to x and y now x comma y it is equal to y comma x i'm writing it like this x comma y is one tuple y comma x is another tuple when i write like this now i call for y it shows me the value of 2 when i call x it gives me the value of y so in this way you can swap variables using tu tuples here the tuples are x comma y and y comma x i, I haven't used the simple brackets by, but by simply separating the elements by commas python interpreter understands it is a tuple so these are the two attractive features of using tuples one is tuple and the tuple assignment we have this as well as the swapping of variables okay then comes dictionaries dictionaries are actually data it is all it is for storing a large amount of data and in dictionaries the data is stored in the form of key value pairs i'll show you that it is similar to a library when you go to a library when you want to check a book we, well, we want to take a book. What you do is that you don't have to go through, browse through all the shelves of the library. What you have to do is that simply search for the uh, book name and then you will get a number. You get a key. With that key, you, you can identify your book. In the same way, a dictionary stores a large amount of data. And by simply knowing the key, you can get a value. So data is always stored in a dictionary in the form of key value pairs. Okay. So using the key, you can get the value. So dictionary, I'm creating a dictionary, dict1 is equal to, dictionaries are always enclosed within curly braces. I'm writing 1, see, 1 is the key, it is separated by 1 is the key, max is the... Excuse me, Miss Maya? Yes. Uh, it's uh, time, could you please? Yes, I'll take just 5 minutes more. Yes. Okay, so 1 is the key and max is the value. The key and values, they are separated by colon. Each of the key value pairs will be separated by commas. So two. This is one dictionary. So you can see it has two key value pairs. There are two elements. In dictionaries, there is no indexing because it is an unordered collection of data. It doesn't matter where the where a key value pair lies. It has no indexing. Okay, so this is one dictionary. You can check the type. You can check the type. Dict one. See, the Python interpreter understands it is a dictionary. You can add a dictionary. You can in a dictionary you can add elements. You can update elements. You can remove elements. All of the built-in functions are the same. You can write. You can use. You can use. You can access them using the slicing operator. You can update. You can add. Clear. Clear the elements within a dictionary. You can delete a dictionary. All these different kinds of the functions are all the same. The built-in functions that we use in the previous cases, all of them apply here also, okay, with the dictionary. So that's a dictionary. Then uh, lastly, we come to Boolean data type. Boolean data type is nothing but true or false, okay? True or false, I'll just quickly show you what is that. Now, uh, say I write a list. I'm, I'm writing a list, one, two, three. This is a list. Now I want to check whether one is present in list. So I write one in list. In is an operator. See, I get true. True is a Boolean data type. Okay. Now, if if I write x equal to true, I'm writing x equal to sorry. Now, if I write uh, four in four in list, four in list, I get false. So true and false are the Boolean data type. In here, in I have used an this is an operator called in. Uh, which checks whether an element is there or not. Also, you have not in operator also. So these are the different st uh, standard data types in Python. There are many more things to say, but I've given uh, you a gist of the st up to the standard data types. I, I hope you all have benefited from this session.
so thank you for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you for your patient listening Good afternoon, one and all. I am Ms. Rachel Francis Paramel, head of the Department of Physics. And I am here to express our heartfelt gratitude to Dr. Maya Mathieu for her invaluable contribution to today's online session on fundamentals of Python program. Dr. Maya's expertise and clean, clear explanation have made this complex subject accessible to all of us, regardless of our prior, prior programming experience. Now we are moving to the next session of this online workshop on unlocking the power of Python, applications in machine learning and deep learning. We are privileged to have with us a distinguished resource person who is an expert in the field of computer science and forensic science. Our resource person for this session is Ms. Krishma Kevi, who currently serves as assistant professor in the Department of Forensic Science at Kerala Police Academy. He is a dedicated scholar and a researcher who is actively contributing to the world of academia and technology. Throughout this session, Ms. Grishma will share her insights and knowledge about Python applications in the realms of machine learning and deep learning, offering valuable perspectives and practical tips. So, without further ado, let us extend a warm welcome to Ms. Grishma Kim. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon to one and one. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay. So please wait, I will share the slides. Is it visible? Slides are visible? Yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. okay, so let us start the session. Uh, very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, myself, Grishma K. with Assistant Professor of Department of Forensic Science, Kerala Police Academy. First of all, I would like to thank for giving uh, this opportunity uh, to deliver a lecture on unlocking the power of Python applications in Machine Learning and Deep Learning by Carmel College Mala and Little Flower Degree College and Degree and PG College Hyderabad. Thank you, the coordinators, the principals and HODs. So let us start the session now. Okay, so to, the agenda for today's session is uh, I will give you a brief idea about the, already you have learned about the Python uh, programming language. Uh, Dr. Maya Matthew gave a detailed explanation about uh, everything, means variables, uh, strings and functions, something like that. So, I will, but I will give you the main features, why we are using this Python in machine learning and deep learning, and what are the different frameworks and libraries that are used in Python, and what do you mean by artificial intelligence, uh, and what is machine learning, and what are the different types of machine learning. And then we will uh, see the uh, basics of deep learning and what are the real world applications of this uh, machine learning and deep learning and what are the some resources for learning also we will see. Uh, so uh, what do you mean by Python? Uh, there are many different programming languages are the uh, like C, C++, Java, but why we are using this Python for uh, artificial intelligence? This is the most popular uh, language nowadays, uh, and we uh, Python and R are used for the artificial intelligence purposes because it is a very general purpose and interpreted high level programming language uh, because of its simplicity and readability. Uh, this is a uh, English like language, so uh, because of this code readability, we are using this Python and it uh, contains a, a loads of frameworks and libraries. Uh, so, uh, its syntax is also very clear and expressive, and it has a standard library also. So. That is the main reasons uh, why we are using this Python. This is used for web development, software development, and automation. 
and in artificial intelligence etc so you have already seen this all these features like it supports a graphical user interface programming and it is very easy to understand and it is free and open source and it is portable scalable uh, and uh, it supports various uh, functionalities and uh, supports various programming also so uh, these are the different types of fields where we are using this python in, we are using this python in data analytics artificial intelligence for data visualizations also we are using and for the, uh, for develop, uh, web development and in the language development uh, google translators or uh, language translators everywhere we are using in uh, in our day to day life we are using uh, this uh, uh, ev uh, every day we are searching something in google uh, so maybe you have wondered why uh, how this uh, google uh, will pro uh, are providing this accurate results about uh, what we are searching for so behind this uh, everything is uh, means artificial intelligence and uh, maybe we are using google maps, uh, maps uh, for uh, traveling purposes so behind this also uh, we are using this artificial intelligence techniques and we are using the social medias like instagram facebook and youtube netflix etc day, uh, daily uh, so there are also uh, some recommendations are also available uh, about some products uh, or some advertisements are also showing uh, every, so all these are because of artificial intelligence they are uh, they know uh, what are the interests or what are, uh, what we like or we don't like something like that okay so uh, these are some of the frameworks uh, that are used for artificial I means uh, python programming uh, like um, you have to head about the anaconda uh, anaconda supports uh, jupyter lab jupyter notebooks and spider and uh, some web development uh, frameworks are django uh, flask is also there and google collab is also using visual studios are using so many frame python frameworks are there like pycharm uh, also and these are the some of the libraries and frameworks uh, and um, uh, i will discuss about for what purpose we are using all this uh, in the next slides okay so some of the machine learning libraries we are using is numpy tensorflow theano and pandas there are some, all these are some of the popular libraries and uh, some of the frameworks we are using for web development is Django, Flask, etc. So, uh, and in data visualization also, we are using Matplotlib and Seaborn also. So, before going through uh, what is machine learning and deep learning, uh, uh, do you have heard about the term uh, artificial intelligence? Uh, you have heard about the Sophia robot. Uh, it will destroy human uh, in future, uh, it says. Uh, so the tech tycoon uh, um, Elon Musk one day said, uh, said that uh, artificial intelligence is a risk to human civilization. Actually, is it a risk or not? That is a debatable question. So what do you mean by artificial intelligence? Actually, this term is coined in 1956 by John McCarthy uh, in a Dakmar conference. Uh, so according to uh, this fa uh, father of artificial intelligence, John McCarthy, it is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines especially intelligent computer programs so uh, you know the artificial intelligence come uh, means composed of the two terms like artificial and intelligence artificial is nothing but man made and intelligence is thinking power so actually artificial intelligence is the man made thinking power so it is the branch of computer science it cre it can create intelligent machines which can behave like human think like human and ability to make its own decisions so that is artificial intelligence and uh, it is uh, uh, artificial intelligence suggests that machine can mimic mimics like human that it can talk like human think like human and learn like human and it, it can plan and uh, uh, means understand and take decisions or make predi predictions according to uh, its experience uh, you know that uh, a four year old child when we are teaching that child uh, showing some pictures this is cat or this is dog uh, giving some pictures or uh, some giving some uh, toys or objects we are teaching him like that we can teach machines or computers by giving some of the pictures or by giving some labels we can teach the computer also this is a dog or this is a cat something like that so uh, artificial intelligence is the subfield of computer science and it contains uh, machine learning uh, deep learning and data analytics big data and it also different types of ai is there uh, narrow ai strong ai we will see what are they so uh, narrow ai is uh, artificial intelligence that is used for the specific domain or specific purpose for example uh, you have heard about the uh, siri alexa and uh, means uh, different uh, 
for different purposes even google translator is a narrow a product uh, and we are using uh, tesla uh, in tesla self driving cars also we are using this that is also designed for specific purpose or, or specific uh, domain that is narrow a general a means uh, this is uh, a mimics like human that means it can uh, think like human and behave like human and it can make decisions like human that is uh, generative ai so some of the applications of artificial intelligence is the uh, is that we are using it in healthcare industry agriculture in education social media and in finance or game developments everywhere we are using this ai so uh, uh, many people have a misconception that uh, these three terms are uh, same or something like that that artificial intelligence machine learning and deep learning is it same or not actually uh, artificial intelligence is a science that getting machines to mimic the behavior of humans so uh, this is a, uh, this is mimicking the human behavior and machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and it focuses on getting the machine to make decisions by feeding some data but uh, in the case of machine learning the human intervention is there uh, the, uh, that means in the case of feature extraction uh, human participation is also there but in the case of uh, deep learning there is no human uh, interception is there and uh, actually the concept of neural networks like uh, uh, we know that in our human brain there are many dendrites neurons are there so mimicking mimicking the human brain we have developed a model that is no, uh, known as deep learning so there is uh, it is completely uh, independent and it can solve many very complex problems also so it is a subfield of machine learning so actually by summing uh, some up uh, all these three terms artificial intelligence machine learning and deep learning uh, are interconnected fields and machine learning and deep learning also artificial uh, aids in uh, artificial intelligence by providing a set of algorithms and neural networks to solve data driven problems so we will see what are the different problems uh, we can solve using this uh, machine learning and deep learning so next we will discuss about what is uh, machine learning machine learning is a science of getting computers to learn without being explicitly programmed what do you mean by without being explicitly programmed you have already uh, created uh, many programs in c c++ java uh, for solving problems but in the case of machine learning there is no need to uh, to be explicitly programmed we are uh, we are giving some data to the computer and we are training that data uh, train the computer using that data and then we will give some uh, test uh, data to the computer then it will uh, it can predict actually uh, the correct uh, results it can make the predictions correctly so that is uh, known as machine learning so in our day to day life we are uh, we can see when we are using the netflix or when we are using uh, means our uh, facebook amazon sites uh, there are many uh, means or other, otherwise we are using playing some music in our mobile phones there are many more suggestions uh, will be there uh, it will shows uh, according to uh, means every music or ads according to our interest so uh, without knowing we are uh, we are all uh, means ai is all around us and uh, in the case of uh, uh, means uh, face facial recognition in, in mobile phones also uh, facial recognition is there so uh, in facial recognitions and um, in traffic so also we can uh, uh, means uh, in the case of object detection everywhere we are using this machine learning and in vehicle detection and every, everywhere so what are the different libraries we are used for this machine learning purpose uh, actually uh, numpy uh, we know that uh, in the case of machines it can only learn zeros and ones that is the binary digits zeros and ones on or off that is the only language uh, a machine can uh, know so uh, we know that we have to uh, convert everything into uh, in the form of integers then only we can convert this integers into binary you have already studied how this decimal numbers can be converted into binary form you know everything so numpy library is used for that purpose we can uh, we can represent everything uh, as in the form of matrix uh, you have studied the matrix rows and columns uh, in plus 2 so uh, we can convert even in the image into a matrix format in the rows and columns by using this library numpy and there are another libraries are also there scipy scikit-learn tensorflow keras pytorch pandas and matplotlib we will see for what uh, for what purpose we are using all this so actually pandas is a data analysis and manipulation library for example if you want to predict the stock ma uh, market prediction 
uh, or the or uh, house price prediction something like that uh, we have some excel data will be there with us uh, in csv format or uh, xls file format so uh, we can load this data into our uh, python uh, means if we are using maybe anaconda jupyter notebook if we are using or otherwise we are using google collab we can load that data by using this pandas library and we can convert that data into mathematical function uh, using mathematical function we are using this numpy library and if you want to visualize some data in the form of graphs and chart you can use this matplotlib library uh, matplotlib library and seaborn libraries are there and tensorflow and keras is other uh, frameworks uh, it contains many uh, data sets and many algorithms of uh, machine learning and deep learning mainly tensorflow is used for machine learning and keras is used for deep learning but uh, both are uh, I mean, Keras is more uh, easy to use uh, with TensorFlow, and SciPy is scientific computing uh, library that also contains many algorithms of machine learning. And PyTorch, PyTorch uh, Scrap is used for web crawling, and SQL model is interact with SQL databases. Actually, when we are developing a, a model or algorithm, uh, we don't need to. Uh, uh aware of all these libraries uh, whichever our uh, purpose we in which field we are uh, using research or uh, maybe we will uh, we are using research in the field of image processing or in the field of data mining uh, so uh, which which library supports uh, for that purpose for example in the case of machine image processing open cv libraries is also needed so which library or each library is used for each purposes so uh, you can study uh, it by using uh, there are uh, many tutorials are available at there uh, their own keras.io website uh, for keras library and tensorflow website is uh, for there so um, everything is uh, means given in that website you can uh, execute the line by line these codes by using google collab or anaconda jupyter notebook so how does this ai machine learning work uh, we already said that machine learning is the science of getting computer to learn without being explicitly programmed. Actually, there are two types of machine learnings are there, not uh, supervised and unsupervised. Actually, uh, there is reinforcement and semi-supervised modeling. Uh, machine learning is also there, but mainly we are focusing on the supervised and unsupervised le uh, learning. So in the case of supervised learning, uh, there is a training data sets will be there. I have already told you that uh, when we are teaching a four year old kid that this is dog or cat, uh, we will uh, show him uh, the picture of uh, dog and cat to the, uh, that kid. Then we'll uh, say that this is dog and this is cat. Uh, like that, for when we are teaching a computer, we are giving the images of dogs and images of cats uh, uh, and we are giving some labels for that images also. That means for the dog images, we are giving a label dog. And for uh, the cat images, we are giving the label cat. So at the time of, uh, at the time of uh, input, uh, when we are uh, giving an input to the machine, we are giving all these, both data are giving. But in the case of unsupervised learning, we have some pictures are there maybe some pictures of fruits or vegetables something like that apple orange character uh, uh, pictures are there but we don't know the labels uh, so uh, we have to classify or group these pictures according to the characteristics or features of uh, that uh, images for example in the case of apples maybe red apples red is the color of the apple and the orange is the color of oranges and banana uh, in the case of uh, banana its length the texture everything shape everything is different so Machine can learn itself uh, by analyzing these data and it can group that apple, orange, and bananas or vegetables, something in different, different groups. So that is machine learning. Uh, so these are some of the different types of machine learnings and uh, different types of algorithms we are using in the machine learning. Uh, in the case of uh, supervised learning, uh, there are mainly uh, classification problems are there and regression problems are there. In the classification problems, we are using nearby decision tree, support vector machines, random forest scan, and these are the different algorithms we are using for classification purposes. For example, uh, the, if, uh, we can che for checking the particular email is spam or not, or particular person is uh, may, uh, female or uh, male, or yes or no question, something like that. We are using the class or COVID or not, uh, some or new, uh, if something if a, a person have a, have a COVID or not, we can that all these problems are the classification problems. So we are using some classification algorithms for this purpose. But in the case of regression, like uh, whether class uh, 
weather forecast predictions or uh, stock super uh, market predictions and in the case of um, house price predictions that is that's all are the regression problems so we are using regression and algorithms are using for that purpose uh, for example linear regression and support vector regression decision tree regression lasso ridge regressions and different different algorithms are used for different different purposes and uh, but in the case of unsupervised learning i have already told you that we are only giving some of the images or some of the data we are not giving uh, the labels so we are using the clustering or grouping algorithms are used uh, like uh, db scan uh, and gaussian mixture k means clustering algorithms and in reinforcement learning that is the decision making algorithms that means uh, uh, in the case of recommendation systems they are used reinforcements learning or from past experience they are learning maybe they will make mistakes but uh, in the next time uh, they will correct that mistake and then we then the computer will learn that is the reinforcement learning uh, so these are the some applications where, where this supervised uh, learning classification algorithms are used in the case of fraud detection and in image classification customer retention or diagnostics of medical images or something uh, in the in that cases we are using classification algorithms and uh, in the case of uh, means weather forecasting or if you want to predict something or process optimizations in uh, everywhere we are using the regression algorithms so these are some of the applications uh, in re uh, reinforcement learning is used for game developments or robots in the case of real time decisions for taking real time decisions we are using this reinforcement learning and unsupervised learnings are used in the case of recommender systems or customer uh, segmentation or uh, feature elicitation or uh, and big data visualization in that cases we are using uh, unsupervised learning so many more uh, applications are there uh, you can search in google uh, for knowing all this uh, so speech, and in the case of speech recognition also we can convert the speech in the form uh, of signals uh, and it uh, convert into the form of numbers and everything and we can make predictions and in the case of medical diagnosis and in online fraud detections uh, in email spam filtering virtual personal assistants everywhere we are using this machine learning applic applications so uh, these are the some of the classification and regression and clustering algorithms here you can see uh, there are two groupings are there circles and triangles are given in the classification how it is grouped and in the case of regression also some uh, according to some uh, we have given some input features and it will predict the maybe uh, maybe in the uh, how in the case of house prediction there may be two bedrooms one kitchen one living room like that some input features will be there according to uh, that it will predict the price of that house like that and in the case of uh, clustering also uh, it will group there is no data is given label is given so it will group according to the features uh, it is uh, red green blue uh, circles are grouped you can see this clustering so this is the uh, so we are giving more data to the computer and we are uh, we are training that computer with this data that it can easily predict when we are giving a new data to that computer to that machine or algorithm or that model uh, and uh, so we have already discussed this supervised about the regression classification problems for predicting the sales reviews for the next quarter. Uh, this is one of the application of supervised machine learning. Uh, I have already told you how this apple and banana is classified. Uh, here input data is app, uh, apple is given and banana is also given. So the more we are giving more, maybe more images are giving maybe 5,000 or 70,000 something images are given and it will train the model. Uh, so it will can actually uh, easily predict it is an apple or it's a banana according to its uh, shape texture uh, other features and in the uh, here uh, also we have given uh, some hexagonal uh, means cube triangles are given and it, uh, you can see it is predicted uh, square and triangle separately hexagon is separately so uh, when we are training when we are giving more data to the machine or model uh, it can easily predict the correct outputs so these are the different different algorithms used for regression and classification random forest decision tree logical uh, logistic regression etc and in the case of unsupervised learning uh, actually it is known as uh, it is uses the machine learning algorithm to analyze and cluster unlabeled data set that is the machine that is the main difference between supervised and unsupervised labeled data is given is in the case of supervised but in the case of unsupervised algorithms we are giving unlabeled data and uh, so uh, 
we have to analyze the patterns of that data then only we can classify that data uh, here uh, only the some images of the cats and dogs are uh, given but we didn't given the uh, labels like this uh, uh, for the image cat we didn't given the label cat uh, and for the image of dog we didn't given and the uh, means a label dog so uh, without uh, giving the labels of these images it can, how this is uh, easily grouping uh, or clustered uh, this data uh, but for that purpose, we are using unsupervised uh, learning algorithms like uh, K-nearest, uh, K-means clustering, uh, and etc. So here is it, it can easily predict according to the features of uh, it will uh, analyze the pixel by pixel information of that images. Uh, so uh, maybe some uh, uh, using hmm, some ear. Uh, or tail features of these images, it can easily identify. This is these are the dogs and these are the cats. Here you can see when we are giving the data to the machine, how it is grouping, how it is uh, clustering. Uh, means it will identify the similarities uh, in the groups. Uh, in the means uh, in a, means in the case of cats and dogs, the patterns are different. So it analyzes the patterns and then it can easily uh, group that patterns. Which is, these are the cats and these are the dogs. And in the case of uh, anomaly detection, also we are using this unsupervised learning techniques learning algorithms are used. So mainly we are using clustering and association algorithms. Uh, in, uh, for example, you have heard about the market basket analysis. For example, if a person is buying a bread, uh, maybe there is a chance for uh, buy uh, means uh, jam also. Or in the case of when we are buying a milk, uh, something other product will be there is uh, a co product will be also uh, there is a chance to buy other product also. So that is the market basket analysis. So in the case of uh, customer uh, finding the relationships between the variables in the large data sets, we are, that is the association rule mining algorithms are used. So these are the main two types of algorithms in the case of unsupervised learning. Uh, mainly we are using K-means, scan and PCA neural networks uh, a priori algorithms. And semi-supervised learning is nothing but it is a combination of supervised and unsupervised learning. That means some data uh, are given as labeled data, but some data are given as unlabeled data. So uh, it, uh, that is a challenge of finding uh, how we can easily classify uh, this data into, into the correct category. So semi-supervised algorithm is a type of machine learning algorithm that represents the intermediate group between the supervised and unsupervised. So uh, and the, its real world applications is in the case of speech analysis and uh, web content classification. Uh, protein sequence classification or text document classifier, image and audio analysis, we are using the semi-supervised learning algorithms also. And the next one is uh, deep learning. Uh, there may, uh, deep learning is nothing but that mimics the human brain. Uh, in our human brain, there are many neurons are there. How these neurons are interconnected, how they are processing the data, uh, that concept is implemented in this deep learning. So. There as input layer will be there and output layer is also there. In between this input and output layer, there are many more hidden layers are there. So that is the concept of deep learning. So deep learning actually is a subset of machine learning and it uses the artificial neural networks to learn from data. Uh, artificial neural networks is the model that is created by making the human brain. And neural networks are inspired by the structure and function of the human brain. And they are made up of the interconnected nodes called, that is known as the neurons. And that it can easily process the information and transmit uh, that information uh, from one neuron to another neuron uh, in the network. So uh, actually this deep learning is a subfield of machine learning that focuses on the development and training of artificial neural networks with multiple layers. Uh, so it is very complex actually uh, if we want to uh, predict uh, a very, co very complex problems or we if we have uh, large amounts of data uh, in our hands then only we are using this deep neural network techniques uh, so these networks are designed to learn and represents complex patterns and relationships in large volume of data uh, you have heard about the term big data nowadays big data is nothing but uh, in by through different social media or uh, like uh, YouTube, Instagram, WhatsApp, we are uploading many images and videos into the internet. So large amounts of data, millions of data are creating day-to-day -day life. So analyzing this data and predicts, uh, uh, means uh, predicts according to, uh, means uh, make some predictions according to this data is very complex procedure. So uh, by handling, 
this data so by processing this data we need uh, the help of this deep learning so deep learning uh, networks are designed to learn and represent the complex patterns and relationships in the large volumes of data uh, we have already seen uh, artificial intelligence machine learning and deep learning how they are interconnected deep learning actually it uh, imitates the way human gains certain types of knowledge how these humans uh, humans are uh, means uh, they how they are learning uh, through uh, these neurons for example uh, here you can see neural okay we will see the neural networks then i will explain how these neurons are uh, learning by itself so large uh, amounts of data by using multi layer neural networks and by using graphical user interfaces uh, graphical processing units gpus and cpus you know that central processing unit and graphical processing units are the without without gpus we cannot uh, work on this deep learning so our system should, uh, should um, means it should support gpus then only we can uh, uh, we can do the means uh, training uh, like uh, image processing uh, to our models uh, so it needs more uh, capacity for our machines to recognize the patterns and for making this some predictions so deep learning has surpassed uh, the traditional machine learning in the accuracy for many applications uh, there is a key driving force in the development of artificial intelligence by uh, for example in the case of uh, machine learning we cannot tune some parameters but in the case of deep learning there are many more parameters are there so by tuning these different parameters uh, we can improve the uh, accuracy prediction Uh, rate of that uh, particular problem so that is the difference between machine learning and deep learning uh, and as in the case of some law enforcement uh, because i am now i am working in the cyber security field that's why i am included the some applications in the law enforcement also because uh, in face recognition in the criminal investigations and identification of suspects we can use this uh, deep learning applications and in the case of license plate recognition of uh, for tracking vehicles and catching uh, this wanted suspects uh, we can use uh, this deep learning and the video and image analysis for the surveillance and crime scene investigation is another application uh, and the predictive policing to identify the potential crime hot spots and allocate more resources that means police resources into that places we can uh, use uh, this deep learning algorithms and uh, we can analyze some data with uh, with the help of this deep learning and fraud detection in financial crime investigations text and speech analysis for counter terrorism and criminal investigations and crowd analysis for public safety and crowd management malware uh, detection intrusion detection everywhere we can use this deep learning and machine learning algorithms and we can use uh, many more predictions this is another example here uh, this person does not exist.com this is a website actually all these persons are does not exist in the world they are created by using the generative adversarial network that is gans Uh, that is used AI to generate endless fake faces day to day life. When we are uh, clicking, uh, if you can access this site uh, by through the URL uh, by typing this person does not exist dot com. Uh, when when we are uh, refreshing each and every time, a new face is generated. So this is created by this artificial uh, intelligence. So uh, we can uh, do a project on uh, deep fakes detection or uh, in images or videos also because many uh, persons uh, you have uh, nowadays it's very familiar about photo labs. It's creating our own images uh, in different. Uh, perspectives and different formats also. So uh, all these are created with the help of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, and even uh, one of the another application we can give uh, means uh, sounds to the silent movies and uh, we can convert the black and white images into the color images and color images into black and white images uh, there are many uh, many more applications are there we can you can implement you are all uh, computer based we see uh, we are learning the computer and you can easily implement uh, with the help of python because uh, small lines of codes maybe uh, 10 uh, within 10 or 15 lines of codes you can easily convert uh, this uh, means uh, images into grayscale or uh, color images into black and white and black and white into the color something like that so uh, it is very easy to uh, learn if you are interested uh, this way you can uh, easily study the python uh, language because uh, everyone is know 2 plus 3 is equal to 5 
those who know two plus three is equal to pi, you can learn Python because Python is an line uh, interpreter language. By using uh, line by line, we can execute the Python language and we can uh, and, uh, means we debug the errors also easily. We can rectify the errors and we can continue. So. These are some of the applications, and you have uh, I have already told you that neural networks. That is means in the uh, in the case of deep learning, we are mimicking the human brain. We are developing a models uh, deep neural networks by mimicking the human brain. How human brain is learning uh, some uh, data and how it makes predictions. Uh, so inspired by the structure and uh, function of this human brain, uh, the one type of deep learning algorithm is developed that is known as neural network. And uh, it, they are made up of the interconnected nodes that is known as neurons. And uh, neural networks are trained to perform a variety of tasks in the case of image recognition, object recognition, image classification, natural language processing. Uh, in Twitter also, we have all, uh, already heard uh, about the hate speech analysis, uh, something like that. And in machine translations also, uh, when we are going to another country, we don't know the language uh, by using the Google Translator also, we can convert that particular languages into English language easily by by taking a photo, something like that. So uh, everywhere we are using this neural networks, deep learning applications. So they are trained by feeding them in a large amount of data and allowing them to learn from that data. Uh, so without data, we cannot, uh, it means deep learning cannot learn. So once a neural network has been trained, it can be used to make predictions on the new data. Uh, so I will uh, show one examples of how this is working uh, in the, after this, uh, Presentation. Okay, so this is the structure of neural networks. Here, uh, some input data is given in the form into the input layer, and many more hidden layers will be there. According to uh, uh, that hidden layer, some weights and biases are attached to them. Some mathematics are using that, and uh, and in finally, the out in the output layer, it can uh, predict. Uh, it can make the predictions according to the features we or inputs we are giving to that particular layers. So this is the uh, structure of typical neuron, how this is implemented in the case of deep learning, in the case of artificial neural networks, inputs. Uh, there are many uh, dendrites are there and uh, some axon and axon terminals are also there. And this is uh, the case of one neuron. Many millions of neurons are there, so it is already interconnected. So likewise, uh, we are creating a model similar to this uh, neuron of human brain biological neuron, how this art artificial neural networks is uh, built. So what is the differences between deep learning and machine learning? In the case of deep learning, uh, there is no human intervention is there and feature extraction classifications, everything is done by the machine itself. But in the case of machine learning, we have to give some uh, feature extraction techniques or we have to give some uh, human, uh, humans are using some instructions to the machines. Then according to that instructions, it makes predictions or classifications, something like that. That is known as deep learning. That is the main difference between deep learning and machine learning. Another difference is uh, in the case of deep learning, we need large amounts of data. Then only we can uh, train the machine uh, into particular using particular algorithm. Without data, we cannot uh, train that particular model or machine. Uh, we can uh, make a particular uh, algorithm. Or we cannot make the model. But in the case of machine learning, uh, with maybe we need only maybe 300 or 10 uh, means 100 or something like uh, less than 100 images is there but we can use machine learning algorithms for the in the case of predictions but in the case of deep learning we need maybe 70000 or 10000 10, more than images or more than data is needed that is the data requirements and in the case of accuracy when we are we are providing more data to the machine uh, deep learning so it provides high accuracy but in the case of machine learning it provides less accuracy because it uses um, less data that uh, comparing with the deep learning uh, so uh, and the training time is also we are using uh, graphic uh, gpu enabled systems for deep learning but in the case of machine learning we need only cpu systems so uh, it trains on the cpu so hardware dependency uh, is request uh, uh, in the case of deep learning it is request gp but in the case of machine learning it requires only cpus and the hyperparameter tuning is only possible in deep learning but in the case of machine learning uh, it is very limited uh, we cannot tune the hyperparameters uh, to improve the accuracy or improve the predictions 
So that is the main differences between deep learning and machine learning. Um, this uh, we have we have already seen the machine learning algorithms like support vector machine classification, regression algorithms, k nearest ne uh, neighbor, and decision tree, and the forest, something like that. But in the case of deep learning, there are uh, many other algorithms are used like deep uh, belief networks, uh, B, uh, DBN, convolutional neural network, CNN. You have heard about uh, that and auto encoder uh, and recurrent neural networks, long short term uh, memory, LS, uh, LSTM. So uh, different different uh, different algorithms are deep learning uh, used for deep learning uh, methods also. Uh, it is um, most popular algorithm is convolutional neural network. We will see what is convolutional neural networks. Uh, that is CNN. In the case of CNN, uh, uh, convolution operation is nothing but that is the matrix multiplication operation actually. So uh, here uh, this is an image of uh, Apple. Here each pixel is given as an input uh, as an input to the input layer by an analyzing this input layer by the hidden layers and it can easily predict this is an apple because its texture and uh, shape features are different uh, comparing with the other uh, fruits so we are uh, we are uh, for taking these images we are using the camera and some pre processing techniques that we are using and we are uh, i mean creating a model using cnn uh, with multiple layers, convolution operations are there because uh, when we are taking a photo in camera, its size will be larger. So, uh, for, but the capacity of a computer will be very less when we are training millions of images, uh, means uh, uh, thousands of images to the computer. So, we have to reduce the size of the uh, each images. So, we will uh, use some pre-processing techniques uh, in the, uh, when we are creating, uh, before creating the model. We are using some pre-processing techniques to reshape the images. And then only we, uh, we will develop the model and train the model. And after that, we can easily predict that uh, model. So. Uh, this uh, here you can see uh, 0 to uh, 9 digits uh, that is the handwritten digits how these are given to the convolutional layer how it is uh, extracting some features uh, of that uh, image and how it's uh, converted into a vector and finally it is predicting that is a 7. Uh, so by adding different layers uh, we can easily uh, is, uh, means, uh, we can easily uh, extract the features of edge, corner, shape, texture, color features of uh, this uh, image 7. Uh, and by using that features, it can easily analyze this is uh, the image 7. Uh, then we are in the next day when we are giving an input uh, 0, it, it can easily uh, predict that is uh, 0. This is another example. Can dogs and by using them we trained using the algorithm so uh, it will check is, uh, is this is an eye or it is, is this a uh, nose or is this cat so it is analyzing the features and then uh, uh, finally it is making predictions how this is cat or this is dog something like that so uh, in the case of when uh, deep learning we are using many more hidden layers uh, uh, in in between this input layer and output layer so other applications are uh, in the self-driven cars, you, uh, in the te like uh, Tesla and automatic handwritten generations and uh, in pixel restoration and deep dreaming also. We are using a new segregations and sound addition to silent films. All these are the, some of the applications of machine learning. We can automatic machine translations is uh, also the, uh, we can use uh, deep learning algorithms for this purpose and detection of growth of the delays in children and in the medical field also we can uh, I means uh, predict whether the person have a tumor or not or cancer or not uh, by analyzing some of the data, medical data something like that. So uh, I will show a video. Machine learning has improved our lives in a number of wonderful ways. Today, let's talk about some of these. I'm Rahul from Simply Learn, and these are the top 10 applications of machine learning. First, let's talk about virtual personal assistants, Google Assistant, Alexa, Cortana, and Siri. Now, we've all used one of these at least at some point in our lives. Now, these help improve our lives in a great number of ways. For example, you could tell them to call someone. You could tell them to play some music. You could tell them to even schedule an appointment. So how do these things actually work? First, they record whatever you're saying, send it over to a server, which is usually in a cloud, decode it with the help of machine learning and neural networks, and then provide you with an output. So if you ever notice that these systems don't work very well without the internet, that's because the server couldn't be contacted. Next, let's talk about traffic predictions. Now say I wanted to travel from Buckingham Palace to Lord's Cricket Ground. 
the first thing I would probably do is to get on Google Maps. So search it. And let's put it here. So here we have the path you should take to get to Lord's Cricket Ground. Now here the map is a combination of red, yellow and blue. Now the blue regions signify a clear road, that is you won't encounter traffic there. The yellow indicate that they are slightly congested and red means they are heavily congested. So let's look at the map, a different version of the same map. And here, as I told you before, red means heavily congested, yellow means slow moving and blue means clear. So how exactly is Google able to tell you that the traffic is clear, slow moving or heavily congested? So this is with the help of machine learning and with the help of two important measures. First is the average time that's taken on specific days at specific times on that route. The second one is the real time location data of vehicles from Google Maps and with the help of sensors. Some of the other popular map services are Bing Maps, Maps.me and here we go. Next up we have social media personalization. So say I want to buy a drone. And I'm on Amazon and I want to buy a DJI Mavic Pro. The thing is it's close to one lap so I don't want to buy it right now. But the next time I'm on Facebook I'll see an advertisement for the product. The next time I'm on YouTube I'll see an advertisement. Even on Instagram I'll see an advertisement. So here with the help of machine learning Google has understood that I'm interested in this particular product. Hence it's targeting me with these advertisements. This is also with the help of machine learning. Let's talk about email spam filtering. Now this is a spam that's in my inbox. Now how does Gmail know what spam and what's not spam. So Gmail has an entire collection of emails which have already been labeled as spam or not spam. So after analyzing this data, Gmail is able to find some characteristics like the word lottery or winner. From then on, any new email that comes to your inbox goes through a few spam filters to decide whether it's spam or not. Now some of the popular spam filters that Gmail uses is content filters, header filters, general blacklist filters and so on. Next, we have online fraud detection. Now there are several ways that online fraud can take place. For example, there's identity theft where they steal your identity, fake accounts where these accounts only last for how long the transaction takes place and stop existing after that and man in the middle attacks where they steal your money while the transaction is taking place. The feed forward neural network helps determine whether a transaction is genuine or fraudulent. So what happens with feed forward neural networks are that the outputs are converted into hash values and these values become the inputs for the next round. So for every real transaction that takes place, there's a specific pattern. A fraudulent transaction would stand out because of the significant changes that it would cause with the hash values. Stock market trading. Machine learning is used extensively when it comes to stock market trading. Now you have stock market indices like Nikkei. They use long short term memory neural networks. Now these are used to classify, process and predict data when there are time lags of unknown size and duration. Now this is used to predict stock market trends. Assistive medical technology. Now, medical technology has been innovated. With the help of machine learning, diagnosing diseases has been easier, from which we can create 3D models that can predict where exactly there are lesions in the brain. It works just as well for brain tumors and ischemic stroke lesions. They can also be used in fetal imaging and cardiac analysis. Now, some of the medical fields that machine learning will help assist in is disease identification, personalized treatment, drug discovery, clinical research, and radiology. And finally, we have automatic translation. Now, say you're in a foreign country and you see billboards and signs that you don't understand. That's where automatic translation comes of help. Now, how does automatic translation actually work? The technology behind it is the same as the sequence to sequence learning, which is the same thing that's used with chatbots. Here, the image recognition happens using convolutional neural networks and the text is identified using optical characters recognition. Furthermore, the sequence to sequence algorithm is also used to translate the text from one language to the other. And that brings us to the end of this video. I hope you guys found Okay, so you have uh, seen the different applications of machine learning and deep learning uh, in the traffic predictions and recommendation systems like that. And another application nowadays we are using that is ChatGPT that is uh, developed by OpenAI in November 2022. Actually, all uh, all of you are using this uh, ChatGPT for uh, creating I means assignments, uh, for writing literature reviews, or writing research papers, uh, or even writing uh, poems or stories. Or writing some letters also we are using this chat GPT nowadays. So uh, it is a chatbot uh, has a language based model that uh, developer fine tunes for human interaction in a conversational manner. Conversation manner, for example, uh, uh, 
uh, this uh, another example is bard google bard also we are using uh, but in the case of chat gpt only uh, it is uh, given only the data uh, till 2021 but in the case of google bard uh, uh, now it means uh, it is uh, working real time so uh, more accurate results it can uh, provide in the case of google bard also um, but actually, these two are working uh, by using this uh, machine learning and deep learning algorithm, by using this artificial intelligence techniques. So there is a chance for errors. Uh, but whenever we are teaching this uh, chat GPT or Google Bard uh, by giving uh, some uh, means notes, it can easily uh, means uh, create means uh, some, uh, it can easily create a short essay or it can easily summarize the data and it can easily uh, give you the main points uh, uh, for creating a uh, PowerPoint presentations. So everyone, everyone uh, is using nowadays this chat GPT. Uh, even me also are using. One second. Is it visible? Slide is visible. Actually, am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are audible in Atma. Okay. okay. Can you see the slides? Yeah, we can see the chat GPT slide now. Okay, okay. Okay, so these are some of the applications and these are some of the resources for learning uh, in Coursera and in Udemy and in GitHub and Kaggle. Uh, there are different uh, resources are available there. You can easily uh, learn uh, machine learning and deep learning free courses are available there uh, in youtube also many uh, means uh, videos are available uh, so and uh, like uh, towards data science.com uh, pi image search many uh, articles like medium.com there are many more articles are also there if you are interested uh, you can uh, easily copy that code and you can paste it in like uh, in the google collab like this I will share the screen. One second. This is Google Collab. Actually, by uh, if you have a Gmail account, you can access this Google Collab uh, by typing collab.research.google.com. You can create a new notebook uh, without installing Anaconda or Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook or Spider without using uh, any other uh, softwares. We can easily access uh, notebooks here and uh, by copy and paste the codes, we can run uh, this code. Here you can see this is a fashion. Uh, Ma'am, it is not visible to us. Not visible? Okay. Slide, uh, yeah, that screen sharing. One second. 